Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Christine Campo and I'm CARE's Senior Advisor on Food Systems. I'm also direct support to Michelle Nunn as Chair of Action Track 4. Thank you all for joining today's third public forum for Action Track 3. This is our chance to learn the latest about Action Track 3. What have they been busy doing? And for this to be a truly a people summit, we need to hear from you. So during the first two public forums in December and in February, we had over a thousand participants and a combined of hundreds of questions. Um, so there's definitely ways that you can get involved in today's uh, session. First, there's the Q&A function, if in case you have any questions. Um, if you have any comments or resources, share those in the chat too. We'd love to, to have them from you. We also you encourage you to join the conversation on the UN Food System Summit community. Amanda, if you wouldn't mind dropping a link in the chat to that. And we're also going to have a few live polls happening in parallel to this live presentation that you're getting today. Speaking of, let's go to our first poll. Uh, Peter or Amanda, if you wouldn't mind dropping a link into the chat. Um, what this first poll aims to do is give us a better sense of who is with us today in the audience. So as some of the questions are going to include, what experience do you have with farming and growing food? Myself, I'm a female small scale farmer from southern Ontario, uh, who spent most of my life farming before uh, turning to international development. Uh, second question, what region of the world are you zooming in from? I'm a Canadian, currently based in Washington. And which of the following outcomes do you hope the UN Food System Summit accomplishes? So that poll is right in front of you now. If you want to start filling that out, that would be awesome. And we're going to come back to that, uh, those results in a minute. So while we give you some time to fill out that questionnaire, let's move to our very first set of speakers. We are pleased to have with us today, Maria Mendel. She's the Chief Executive External Relations Policy and Advocacy at the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, and Jao Kampari, Leader of Global Food Practice for the WWF International. Jao has more than 20 years of experience with international development, particularly in working between the balance of agriculture production and food system conservation. And lucky for me, he's the chair of Action Track 3, so we work very closely on a daily basis. Over to you, Miriam. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Christine. Uh, well, my name is Miriam Medel, and I represent the Secretariat of the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, which is one of the three Rio conventions. Our mandate is to support parties in fighting against the certification, land degradation, and drought. And ultimately, um, since um, 2018, our strategic framework evolves around achieving land degradation neutrality. This means that the quality of our land resources remains stable or improves, helping to restore the balance between human and nature that we unfortunately have now destroyed. Uh, at UNCCD, as, as the convention is known, we are honored to be the, anchor, the UN anchor agency. Uh, and we are looking forward to working with all of you who are here to bring concrete transformative initiatives to the summit. Um, the pandemic, everybody is very much aware, has exposed the critical link between the health of nature and human health. Due to its rapid onset and spread, there is now very acute awareness of its root causes, namely the abuse and overexploitation of nature. Sadly, our food systems, which are what sustain us here on earth as humans, are a main cause for this overexploitation and its effects, its effects are driving also the linked crisis, the linked climate and biodiversity crisis which are the two topics that our two Rio Convention sisters um, address. As, as people in this, in this forum may know, the overarching principle uh, governing the work of Action Track 3 is that nature should no longer suffer uh, from how we produce our food. Yet, it's not only nature that, that suffers, but only humans. The term nature positive refers then to the outcomes of the choices we make, the practices we employ, um, and how ultimately we produce uh, our food throughout its cycle. 
by replenishing, replenishing our natural capital, the land and the water, regenerative, regenerative, regenerative food production can also deliver people and climate and biodiversity positive outcomes. So we advocate that food production is safe and economical for both producers and consumers, and it doesn't compromise the needs of future generations. Um, if we work of if we walk towards inclusive processes uh, for food production, we will have created um, empower. We will have empowered food producers, especially women, youth, and the most vulnerable. Dignified jobs, safe working conditions, secure tenure, and access to resources and benefits, and resilient livelihoods must be at the heart of any new business model for nature positive food production. As the anchor agency for this track, we are here to support you with technical knowledge and with respect to aligning your work with our intergovernmental processes that, as I said, concentrates on fighting against the certification, drought, and land degradation, but also with other processes and initiatives carried out by the United Nations. We ultimately want to contribute to have to make all the 17 SDGs come a reality. Um, and because we really very much want to link this, uh, this process of the food systems and specifically of the action track tree with our process, um, we will today introduce um, a little bit more of my colleague Sasha Alexander when it's his turn in, in, in part three of this uh, forum. He will um, explain more deeply how land degradation neutrality, how this concept that I referred to at the beginning can support nature positive production. Um, for us, and based on previous experiences, uh, it is very important that this summit is a people summit and a solution summit. We recognize that transformative change in our food production systems will be difficult and it will take time and it will look different uh, across the world. Uh, that is why uh, the role of all sectors of, and actors of society is so crucial. Um, the people in this forum and everybody who has been sending us their uh, game-changing solutions are the ones who know where are the obstacles and where are the opportunities in the national context, as well as which processes are needed to truly drive the required change to boost nature positive food production at sufficient scales and use it as a component nationally and globally to recover uh, from, uh, from the pandemic. So it has to be also a part of any post-pandemic recovery plan. Uh, with your support of everyone who is here, we can expect concrete results at the summit and that is what is, is very exciting for us. We hope that by September, there will be a lot of awareness around the world on the importance of food systems to achieve sustainable development um, and to ultimately transform the way we produce our food um, for the benefit of our nature, but also of the people of this planet. Thank you very much. Over to you. That was wonderful, Miriam. Thank you so much uh, for the brilliant opening remarks, set the right tone for the discussion today. And you highlighted the need uh, to consider resilient livelihoods must be the heart of every proposition. Uh, thanks for that because Action Track 4 focuses on equitable livelihoods. And later on during today, we're gonna have a special session on how the focus areas of each Action Tracks are working really to closely together uh, to make sure we cut across all that. Zhao, over to you. Uh, Christine, thank you very much. I am having uh, internet issues, so I'm using my mobile phone to talk to you on a 3G. Can you hear me well? Perfectly well. Thank that you. Sounds great. Uh, all right. Thank you, and I apologize. So, um, you know, welcome everyone. Christine, thank you very much for agreeing to facilitate our workshop. I think this shows integration uh, across action tracks. So, my huge thanks to you. And, and Miriam, delighted to be working with you and the UN uh, CCD team on Action Track 3. Uh, many of you have participated before in our public uh, fora, submitted ideas for game changing solutions, uh, you know, or you have become a member of, of the online community. So, uh, but some of you may be new. This may be your first uh, time for Action Track 3. So, I'll just give you a broad overview. Uh, Thanks, uh, Peter. So we work 
um, across uh, three action areas, as we call it. It's protect, manage, and restore. And our goal is to boost nature-positive production systems at scale to globally meet the fundamental human right to healthy and nutritious food while operating within uh, planetary boundaries. In our last fora, many of you were asking uh, us, what is the definition? What do we mean by nature-positive production? And we passed that question. There, are, there is a science, an independent science team that provides support and guide us uh, on the science front. And we posed that question to them. And last, when was that? Two weeks ago, they published a paper. I really encourage you to read the paper. It's on our uh, website. And with the definition of nature positive production and some of the terms that they use, I mean, it really, it really resonates with us. So the, the definition for nature positive are production systems that consider and take environment and biodiversity as the foundation of critical ecosystems and, and, and the services that they provide. And they rely on the protection, sustainable management and restoration of, of degraded or degraded, degrading ecosystems. So this is, this, this is the foundation for, for our work on Action Track 3. So now you, we have a definition to work with. Uh, next one, please, Peter. Uh, we deliver, uh, we are in charge, I mean, in Action Track two, 3 of delivering the SDGs that you see in the front, SDG 2, 3, 12, 14, 13, 14, and 15. We take the SDGs 1, 5, 9, 10, and uh, I can see the, the last number as principles, and we contribute to SDG 6, 8, and 16. So uh, when we talk about nature positive production, we bring all these SDGs into play. Next one, please, Peter. Uh, part of our work uh, is anchored on the development of solutions. We say we call it game-changing solutions, ideas, or propositions. And over the past few months, all action tracks have been gathering ideas from multiple places. By March, we had about 1,200 solutions suggested from the wider global community. All these sources that you see on the life left-hand side. And, all, and ideas are still coming in. So the solutions generation process is ongoing while ideas have been clustered, nothing is yet really finalized. And there is always uh, room for continue to evolve our thinking. Next one. The idea, 200 of, uh, 220 plus ideas of those 1200 came from action track three. We had uh, several uh, um, sectors uh, bringing forward these ideas, member states, civil society, private sector, producers associations, research and academic institutions, UN agencies, and you see their individuals because they did not qualify themselves, themselves as any of the others. So this is where our ideas are coming from, from the public survey. Next one, Peter, please. We have game changing solutions have been submitted in two ways. Okay, the, the Action Track leadership team took stock of the first uh, 100 ideas submitted by mid February and consolidated them to create an initial list of 24 solutions, if you will. That doesn't mean anybody's submissions were discounted. We're taking in all submissions. It just means that we focused on the areas that were bubbling most prominent to, to, to the surface, if you will. Now, we have process 103 by mid-February in wave two, which we're doing it right now, uh, is anything that came in from mid-February until now for a package of 220 solutions in our action track so far. Next one, Peter. Thank you. Uh, all action tracks have been working to create what we call action areas. These are the, the three action areas for action track three are the ones that you see in front. We will work towards the, the you know, from now until the summit to protect nat natural ecosystems, to manage sustainably existing food production systems and restore degraded ecosystems. Uh, so these are the three action areas that we will deliver on. Next one, Peter. All right, so let's talk a little bit about each one of these. 
Uh, you can scroll down three slides, please. This is the one that I need. Thank you. These are this is a summary of our of our, our action areas that I uh, um, just explained. So the first one, we need to protect natural ecosystems from new deforestation and conversion for food and feed production. And in this action area, uh, we will discuss uh, how to re how to. Uh, uh, to eliminate conversion and deforestation from food supply chains. We will discuss uh, agri-food uh, support, including subsidies, uh, the land, fresh water, and access to maximize ecosystem services for both. Uh, we will be discussing trade for the protection of natural ecosystems. Now, the manage uh, area for collective action. We will, hold on, something's happening to my phone. I'm so sorry about this. <laughs> We will be discussing uh, like livestock uh, approaches like nature positive livestock production, regenerative agriculture, agroecology, which is coming, it's, it's the, at the front and center of what we do in Action Track 3. And in fact, it's at the front and center of what we do in many Action Tracks. We will have an opportunity to discuss that later. And then um, you can see the, 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 the blue food, which is coming very strongly in our Action Track as a cross cutting uh, um, uh, approach to food. And then we have restore, like the creation of a soils hub or grass restoring grasslands and savannas ecosystems. Uh, so we have, a, a, these are the three buckets, if you will, uh, of our action areas. Let me see if there is another slide. Uh, this is it from me, Christine. Uh, we will be discussing moving forward these three action areas with the leads for each one of them. So I will be here. Um, hopefully my internet will get restored. Uh, thank you so much. Over to you, Christine. Thanks for that, Joe. We definitely now have a good definition of what the scope of Action Track 3 is and how and what SDGs specifically are we targeting uh, to contribute to through this Action Track. I am personally incredibly impressed by the amount of work that Action Track 3 has has undertaken to make this really a people's summit and really harvest solutions 1200 by March alone. This is incredible. And as you rightly say, none of these are going lost. I know a lot of us are processing them, analyzing them, merging some together, really pulling out these golden nuggets from the 1200 and more keep coming in and will continue to come in until the day of the summit, I'm sure after the summit itself. So let's dig a bit deeper into that, into the action areas to learn how you are doing that processing analysis, how we are dealing with all this. So we're very fortunate today to have the chairs from Protect, Manage and Restore. Uh, so we have Fabio and Isabella from Protect, uh, we have a video from Juan Lucas Restrepo because I know his internet just went out uh, on manage and then we're going to hear from Ritala and Leanne on restore and the question that I'm going to pose to each of you is you're leading one of the action tracks. Uh, action, one of the three action areas, protect, manage, or restore. So what is the problem that each of you are solving? What are, what are you working to resolve? And what are the game-changing solutions that have been offered specifically to your uh, action area so far? So I'm gonna ask the, the speakers as well to introduce yourself in one or two sentences when I hand the mic over to you. And we're gonna start with Fabio on protect. Over to you, Fabio. Hello, thank you so much, Christine. Uh, thanks also to Miriam and to João, uh, João especially for the guidance during the past few days. Also thankful to my friend uh, Isabella Coziel who is here. And Isabella, please, if I forget something, do, do help me. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, cloudy day, uh, and very happy to, to, to see all the work together here. Well, on, on, on Protect, as, as, as João COVID, we have received a lot of brilliant ideas for game changing. And, uh, and I think our, our, our main goal uh, is expressed there, is, uh, is that to, to, to food systems and food production can, uh, can, can be undertaken in such a way that nature remains protected. Uh, so basically, we are proposing ways and means to safeguard natural ecosystems and to ensure that natural ecosystems are not further converted for, for food and feed production. Uh, and therefore, we have four different work groups. And, and, and inside these groups, we have the whole set of game-changing solutions that, uh, that have been forwarded to us. 
So the first one is related to deforestation and conversion. It's basically to transform commodity supply chains to benefit people and to protect and restore nature. Uh, the second one is in terms of policy, policy reform and, and, and public support, including subsidies. The third one uh, is the land freshwater nexus. It's a, it's, a, it's a global movement to protect and restore riparian buffers in private agricultural lands. Uh, and last but not least, trade to develop a codex planetarius, which is a set of minimum environmental standards for global food. Uh, we think that in, in, with this line of work, our, our agenda here, it, it connects not only to the UNCCD agenda, but also very closely to the uh, UN uh, CDB uh, as well. And, and of course, with links to climate. And then with how our, our, our work here connects to the other groups to manage and to restore uh, uh, more specifically is something that we are going to be able to, to discuss later with you. So thank you very much. And uh, Isabella, if, if there's anything else that you want to add, please go ahead. That's perfect. I'll jump in at questions, thanks. Thanks for that, Isabella. Then we'll move to our next uh, action area, which is manage. And we have a video from Juan Lucas Restrepo. Restrepo sorry. Wonderful. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to start by expressing my apologies for not being here with you live today. I'm sure Joao and my colleagues, uh, however, will bring all of your ideas, inputs, insights uh, to nurture our uh, process of action track three and action area two of the Food Systems Summit. I would like, uh, through this uh, short video, to present our action area two. That's related to managing sustainably existing food systems in land and water for the benefit of nature and people. And also to present you with uh, a few of the game-changing solutions we have collected, uh, synthesized and integrated uh, so far. So our action area two basically aims to identify pathways to nourish people adequately within planetary boundaries. For the past a few decades, uh, humanity has been quite successful uh, given the Green Revolution and an uh, important uh, uh, delivery of technologies that have allowed to in intensify uh, productions uh, significantly to uh, produce enough food for the current population, actually a little bit more food than the current population uh, requires, although there is a lot of uh, issues in relation to its distribution, availability, uh, etc. that of course the uh, Food System Summit uh, needs to deal with and, and address. But this increase in, the, in productivity in overall production uh, and the through the simplification and intensification of production systems has come at a cost, an important cost for nature uh, in terms of the, the degradation of key natural resources such as uh, land and water, and has also carried a cost for uh, human health, uh, as of course the diet has become more homogeneous and a more homogeneous diet with less diversity on our plates means a, a lower availability of key micronutrients uh, and important uh, elements uh, to keep a, a healthy diet and, and, and have you know, healthy and energetic uh, lives. So this model is a model that has done a lot for humanity, but that needs to change. As today, it accounts for about 25 to 30% of global uh, greenhouse emissions. Uh, it, you know, there is a very strong linkage on deforestation and agriculture and turning natural habitats into a pro 
productive uh, agricultural landscapes, and this is something that we need to uh, to protect and hopefully, uh, you know, give back land for uh, restoration and rebalance uh, the equilibrium between agriculture uh, and, and nature. And of course, this uh, strong con conversion has not only affected biodiversity, the large mammals, and that biodiversity we recognize easily, but it has also gone against agriculture as such, as of course the diversity in microorganisms, uh, pollinators, etc., uh, has also been put under a lot of pressure. So we uh, need to see how we produce more food, but at the same time make production uh, more sustainable and reduce pressure, this kind of pressure on our ecosystems and improve nutrition, make sure what consumers get in their plates, it plates it's affordable and it's diverse uh, enough to feed uh, them uh, well and help them uh, live a you know, prosperous and an enjoyable life. So we are uh, open to receiving all of these uh, ideas, <laughs> acknowledging that there are no one size fits all uh, solutions. We understand and that there are many uh, different uh, approaches, nature positive approaches from digital farming to traditional and indigenous knowledge, uh, etc., that uh, will seek and help uh, farmers and fishers to design and implement and, and work around nature positive solutions on their own geographies and specific socioeconomic contexts. So in the past couple of months, uh, we have crowd crowdsourced a great number of ideas of game-changing solutions that could address these challenges. This has happened through different channels, including events such as this one. So I will very briefly cover uh, the, how we have organized things about eight themes that may change uh, as this new wave of game-changing solutions is brought uh, on board. So we are, uh, one of these themes uh, is related to innovation. So how we transform agricultural innovation for climate, uh, nature, and people. There is a second theme related to livestock with, that has brought a lot of interest from across uh, action tracks, not only action track uh, three, uh, related to how we help uh, livestock production adopt nature positive production systems, how we enable a just transition of livestock production to create jobs and secure livelihoods. Uh, the third theme is related to regenerative uh, agriculture, how we adopt regen more regenerative pra uh, practices for resilient landscapes at scale. So it's basically that area, again, changing solution related to sustainable intensification. How do we produce more with less less inputs, for example. It's about, the fourth one is uh, about agroecology. There is a lot of interest in agroecology from across action tracks. Uh, as, you know, different stakeholders see uh, agroecology from a resilience uh, focus, uh, from a nutrition focus, from an income generation focus. So we're basically trying to gather all this uh, important uh, interest around scaling out agricultural, agroecological production systems and how we generate and promote a, a wide scale adoption of agroecology within farms and rangelands. The fifth theme uh, that's converging is related to agrobiodiversity, how we can safeguard, how we can increase agrobiodiversity for, for improved production and resilience and broad, broaden the genetic base uh, of nature positive production systems, uh, supporting farmers, but you know, the whole food system uh, across, across the board. Uh, the sixth theme is related to blue foods. And there is also a very important uh, and strong movement uh, related to sustaining, also safeguarding, but also expanding the sustainable, resilient blue food uh, production systems and addressing what are called invisible underwater issues for food systems uh, in, around this blue food 
revolution. The seventh theme is related to indigenous peoples uh, and their food systems uh, and conservation and biocentric restoration. And the eighth one is uh, around sustainable finance. Uh, there is an idea of an impact uh, fund uh, for climate smart food systems uh, investment, but that's, you know, like a water in the ocean. It's very small and we need to bring that game changing solution uh, into a larger, the larger uh, picture together with other, other action tracks to try to understand and facilitate the huge uh, need for resources to uh, allow for transitioning and transforming our food systems in the future. So that's uh, where we are. Uh, all these uh, solutions uh, will be or are being complemented with what is coming from the second wave that will finish in the uh, coming uh, days and that you can still you know, bring forward your ideas uh, through the link that uh, hopefully is on your screen. So we look forward uh, to finalize, to engage with you on scaling up these ideas together and truly building a nature positive food system. Thanks for your engagement and interest. Back to you, Joao. Thanks, Juan Luca. Juan Lucas, even though it's by video, video that was incredibly interactive. Um, now that we're all living on Zoom these days, it feels like half of us are living a video every day. Um, next, we're gonna move to Restore and we have Leanne and Riptan Lal who are going to be with us uh, presenting them on, on that action area. So maybe we start with Leanne. Hi, thanks, Christine. Welcome, everyone. I am Lee Winowicki. I'm a soil scientist at World Agroforestry based in Nairobi, Kenya. And the aspiration of the Restore Action Area is to restore degraded ecosystems and rehabilitate soil function for sustainable food production. We are demonstrating the role of healthy soil in the global food system, including ecosystem restoration. I wanted to say that the game-changing solutions submitted demonstrate how improved and inclusive management of agriculture and rangeland systems can restore the function of the soil. That includes carbon storage for climate change mitigation, enhanced soil fertility for improved productivity, and enhanced water holding capacity for improved resilience, just to name a few. But importantly, these game-changing solutions highlight the importance of embracing a systems approach. We need to acknowledge the connection across and between soil, grasses, trees, fruit, livelihoods, and incomes. And it is this holistic approach that will really enable the scaling of boosting nature positive solutions. So as Joao said, we had over 1200 game changing solutions. And within the restore action area, we've tried to merge and find this thread and systems approach. So the first two that I'll talk about, and then Dr. Lau will talk about the soils hub, is about grasslands and savannas. Now, why did we have this? If you remember from the November or December public forum, we listened. We were called out for not having enough inclusion of livestock and grasslands in Savannah. So now we have an entire game changing solution around restoring grasslands um, through livestock based food systems. And this has two components around a multi stakeholder platform and the development of a global data platform for grasslands and shrublands in Savannah. Now, this is very much related to number 18, which is around monitoring and data. So we all know that we are flooded with too much data and yet we don't use enough data and evidence in decision-making. So this is about enhanced restoration monitoring and data to really guide investment. It includes combining innovations and systematic assessments of ecosystem health, including soil health, combined with crowdsourcing and remote sensing to enable farmers, land managers, scientists, and decision makers to track progress 
on the interventions being implemented on the ground. In addition, there's the very important element of stakeholder engagement with evidence to really encourage and scale the use of evidence in decision making and prioritizing of investments. Now to tee Dr. Lal up, I'd like to say that some say that soil is so prevalent, it is often overlooked. I think, Leanne, I think we froze on your end because I can still see some other participants moving, but I don't see you moving anymore. Um, well, that was the perfect introduction to Ratan. Ratan, do you want to kick us off on <laughs> It was like perfectly timed. Over to you, Ratan. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think the connection has not been very good today due to some reason. First of all, uh, thank you uh, very much, Kristin, but I also want to commend and uh, support what Mariam Medal had to say about UNCCD. I am very proud to be a member of the science policy interface of UNCCD. And in 2012, when Luke Ganadia was the Secretary General, uh, he had commissioned a report which was presented at the Rio Plus 20, and it was called Zero Net Land Degradation. And that report was printed and published, adopted by the Rio Summit. And it was written by me and uh, Uriel Safril from uh, Ben Gurion campus and Ben Bohr from the University of Sydney. And that is what transformed eventually into land degradation neutrality concept that is uh, now being adopted. So I think uh, just wanted to give you some history of that. And the land degradation neutrality concept is very important because 30% of all soils of the world are degraded. And when they are degraded by erosion, salinization, depletion of organic matter content, uh, acidification, uh, decline in soil biodiversity, uh, all of those culminate into reduction in soil organic matter content which eventually provides a positive feedback to climate change through emission not only of carbon dioxide, but of methane, which is 28 times global warming potential, and nitrous oxide, which is 310 times global warming potential. And organic matter content in some soils of the developing countries, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Caribbean, the Indian region, is less than 0.5%, often 0.1%, where the optimum level should be 3 to 4%. Consequently, even when we put in fertilizers, they are not effective. In fact, they are jeopardy because they are leaked back either into the water or emitted into the atmosphere. Even the impact or miracle of varieties cannot be realized because soils are not responsive. So restoration is very critical. I fully agree the need to produce more, but I think there's a question of, is that mean bringing more land under agriculture? Or does it mean restoring the degraded lands, already more than 2 billion hectares, and returning some land back to nature? That's a philosophy that we have to promote and that's the basis of restoration. Uh, Lay mentioned about the hub and I must say, uh, Zhao had some excellent idea. Uh, 1200 solution total, uh, 200 and increasing, more the merrier definitely, but unless they are streamlined, unless they are organized, unless they are presented in such a way that we highlight perhaps 20, maybe 25 key issues that can be implemented, 1,200, 1,500, 2,000 can be overwhelming. Nobody's going to read it, not the Secretary General for sure, and the implementation. So somewhere we have to figure out, yes, 1,500, 1,200 is a great idea, how to streamline them, how to coalesce them, how to bring them into some kind of cluster so they can be implemented. 2,000, 1,200 cannot be implemented. And that is where the soil hub is. Therefore, soil hub has 
four sub themes. Number one is what are the recommended management game changing solution which fit under soil? Uh, what are the themes? For example, theme can be global warming, water conservation, recycling, um, soil um, management, fertility, integrated soil fertility management, uh, soil restoration and land degradation neutrality, agroecology and biodiversity, one health concept. The health of soil, plants, animal, people, and the environment is one and invisible. I want to emphasize the word one health. By the way, it came from Sir Albert Howard. He was president of the Indian Science Academy in 1920. His like presidential address was health of soil, plants, animal, people is one and indivisible. He was the one who promoted the idea to John Rodale of organic agriculture. He was the one who developed the composting pit in 1920 called Indoor Pit. So when the word soil is missed out from the One Health concept, it got kind of amputated. It's not a complete sentence. The person is missing the history there. So that's a very important part. The second part of that hub is the recommended practices to address those themes, such as conservation agriculture, such as agroecology, such as precision farming, agroforestry, afforestation, complex farming system, and so forth. So we will lump them all. Nothing will be left out, but they'll be streamlined and lumped. And then come the implementation. The third part, implementation means empowering farmers, empowering women, payment for ecosystem services that they generate, education, public-private partnership, how to involve industry into it, soil protection policy, soil protection policy at national, regional, continental, and global level. We do not have one yet. In the US, we got a Water Quality Act we have Air Quality Act, but there is no Soil Quality Act. If US can implement Soil Quality Act, the others might follow it also. So land tenure rights, access to imports and so forth. So those things will be implemented. So that's the third part of the Soil Hub. And the fourth part, which is very important, which we have not yet discussed, uh, is the impact. What is the impact of all these activities, the theme recommended practices, implementation on sustainable development goals, on land degradation neutrality, on food nutrition security, on promoting nutrient sensitive agriculture, on rewarding farmer for payment of ecosystem services. That impact part is very critical. Unless we can show how to monitor the impact, again, we left things hanging up. So the soil hub will have four separate components. And I want to go back to what uh, the original idea that Joe proposed was, is soil a factor of production or is soil also an environmental regulator? In fact, it is both. And we will eventually feed back into this to provide that, that how both can be implemented. I think this is the way not only the soil hub should be coalescing, uh, bringing clusters together, streamlining, but many other uh, recommended game-changing solution should also be streamlined properly. 1,500, 2,000, great idea, very impressive, but not implementable, overwhelming, unless they are streamlined. I will next time we meet, I'll show this diagram, which I'm in the preparation right now. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much for that, Ratan, both for the excellent presentation, but also for explaining the origin and definition of some of these terms that I repeated across the action tracks. And I'm never quite sure, like One Health, I think I understand, but always good to have it explained. There's lots of really good questions like this coming in through the Q&A. So I welcome speakers. Once you think you're off the hook and you've done your presentation, please go to the Q&A and help fill out some of those, those questions coming our way because we have a few Q&A sessions, but we won't have a chance to get to all of them today. Um, I have one question that's come in uh, for the, the speakers who we just heard. Um, there's quite 
few common threads cutting across all of your three action areas in action track three. Um, so maybe I might ask Fabio, how do you foresee these cross-cutting themes interacting in the game-changing solutions that the summit will bring to bear? Fabio? Yes, uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good question and we've been, uh, we've been asking our, our teams to, to, to kind of of select points in other groups that they think they can collaborate with. Uh, so we basically have representatives for, for all, all, all the different issues. And I think this, this not only inside our, our action track tree, it also crosses all the other different tracks. I'll give you an example, for instance. In our case, we, uh, since our goal is, 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 is the protect one, uh, if we pick, for instance, cases where we have lots of unproductive land across the planet, especially here in my country, in Brazil, there's quite a lot, there's 60 million hectares of very unproductive land, uh, which, is quite a, which is quite a lot. So if we turn this land productive, this is going to protect so much nature, right? But in order to do that, of course, there has to have management, there has to have restoration, we have to pay attention at livelihoods, and then it touches your action track for Christine, uh, and it, so it it, it 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 touches on climate resilience, since it avoids deforestation. So it, it has to be connected, and it, it multiplies, I think, our work a little bit. But it also turns it more exciting because we can get to know all these different partners across the globe. So I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, that was perfect. And I'm going to take one more that I saw from the audience. Um, Molly Anderson, thanks so much, Molly Anderson. I know you're quite involved in the governance and human rights work that we're all trying to do. And I'm gonna pose this question to Jiao, but I know when we get to all the action track leads, um, it's, it's a question for all of us. So how do you see the goals of advancing human rights for those affected by the food system entering into the criteria for selection? So I'll speak quickly on action track four. I know. I'll pop a little link or somebody can pop a link of our discussion starters into the chat because you'll really see that human rights is at the center of the work. When, when we were doing that initial scoping, it really is how act, all of the action tracks are really looking to define um, its work. And I know to make sure that we do it right, we have three globally recognized human rights special raptors on the right to food. We have a climate and environment special raptor, right? A special rapporteur helping us. And in all our, our leadership groups, we have um, experts from indigenous right communities or human rights experts, um, but we definitely need more. And we're trying to bring them together across the action tracks to learn from each other, to share what we're doing in each of the action tracks. So if you'd like to get involved in that, um, please do let us know because we definitely need more help there. Joe, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, Christine. And thanks, Molly, for asking the question. I'm having a really hard time uh, switching to my Q&A because of the iPhone. So thanks for reading the questions um, to me, Christine. Uh, Rights-based approaches is at the basis of every action track. You know, we will be able to hear more from um, the other chairs, but we take this super seriously. We've been working with uh, Michael Fakri, who has been really pushing us uh, you know, and guiding us through this process. So anything that we do in the action tracks must be based on rights-based approaches, uh, Molly. And if it's not, then it shouldn't be a part of the action track. It shouldn't be a game-changing solution. And especially for action track three, where we talk about nature positive, I always like to remind ourselves that our goal statement is to meet the global human right to healthy and nutritious food for all within the planetary boundaries. So nature positive needs to serve the purpose higher than nature, the intrinsic value of nature itself. Uh, and, um, you know, I think we're doing, we're making really, really um, hard efforts to, to, to deliver value beyond nature. So that nature positive also means uh, to be people positive. And we take this, um, you know, into our heart, into our mission in Action Track 3. And in fact, in all Action Track, uh, in all Action Tracks. Actually, it would be nice, um, Christine, when we move into the uh, session with all Action Track chairs to explore this and hear from others as well. Thank you. 
Not letting you off the hook, Joe. I have one more question for you about how food loss and waste is being considered under Action Track 3. Oh, yes. Um, uh, we were initially considering food waste in Action Track 2 uh, in consumer behavior and food loss in Action Track three because it deals with um, uh, at farm and post harvest loss and what we decided to do is to put those two together and work along the continuum of food loss and food waste in one action area and this is being led now by uh, action track two so it's uh it's you know we are bringing the best assets and people from action track three into that action area on food loss and waste, which is managed by Action Track uh, 2 right now. So it's, it's there. Excellent. Thank you. I think that's all the time we have for this session. So as we move to the next uh, Action Track Leads session, there is an interactive game that we would continue to ask you to play with us. Um, so if you look into the chat box, you'll see a link to Upvote. Um, and what we want you to do is an answer, once you get to that link, you'll be answering the question, um, enter the answer that is most important to you. And we'll be able to vote on different solutions. Um, and which of the solutions do you think has the most potential? What do you think should be added to, expanded as far as solution? Are there examples that you have? And at the end of today's event, Jao is gonna be presenting uh, the, the, oh, perfect. Thanks for that, Peter. Peter's brought that up for, for those of us who always struggle with these things a little bit. So as you can see, the questions are right there. If you pull up the link and fill in um, the examples and, and what you think deserves the greatest vote, Jao will be bringing up that overview at the end of today's session. Um, great. For, for timing, I'm going to move straight us into uh, how us action tracks are working together. I wanted to highlight, since, since I'm the moderator, but also one of the action track leads right now, I wanted to just repeat what Juan Lucas said in his video. He was talking about agroecology. And I know for us, it cuts across the action tracks. For action track three, of course, it's the best production model for the environment, the fraction track four, it's food sovereignty, it's, it's, it's the right to seeds for small scale farmers, fraction track five, it's connection to land and connection to communities against shocks and risks, since that's what they're, they're asked to come at it from, and the benefits to nutrition, and again, it, these things cut across all of us. So I'm going to start off with Lawrence Haddad, who is the executive director of GAIN, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, and he's also a World Food Prize awardee in 2018, not like anybody needed to be reminded of that. Um, so Lawrence, what does natural positive mean to you in Action Track 1? Thanks, Christine, and thanks, Zhao and Action Track 3 team for inviting all of us to this session. It's fantastic to be here, and uh, it's a great testimony to the fantastic collaborative spirit we have across the Action Tracks. Um, what does nature positive mean to some of the work in Action Track 1? I've got three examples for you, and I've got two minutes. One, one minute, 30 seconds now. First example is um, we're, we're doing a lot of work on uh, anemia for women and wasting for children under the age of five. And animal source foods are important to prevent wasting and to prevent anemia. So when we do this work on animal source foods, whether it's eggs, dairy, fish, or, or poultry, or, or even red meat, we have to, of course, pay a lot of attention to greenhouse gas emissions. So how can we do this in a way that is not going to um, detract from our ability to meet the Paris target? So that's the first example. Second example is we're doing a lot of work on promoting vegetables. So vegetable consumption is one of the true sort of no regrets interventions on the nutrition side. It's good to prevent non-communicable uh, diseases and chronic uh, diet-related non-communicable diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and, and, and uh, heart disease. And it's also good to prevent um, the stunting and, uh, and wasting and, uh, and other things, especially if it's dark green leafy vegetables. But we're very conscious of the fact that uh, different vegetables have different water requirements, different nitrogen cycle requirements, and different phosphorus cycle requirements. So we have to factor that in to, to the work we do. And the third, third example is doing a lot of work on food safety. Uh, and here, one of, the, one of the deterrents to people consuming fresh foods 
is worries about pesticides uh, and herbicides. Uh, and of course, if we can uh, reduce the amount of pesticides and herbicides that are used on fresh foods, then it's a complete win-win in terms of the environment and in terms of food safety and the consumption of nu safe, nutritious food. Back to you. Excellent. Thanks for that, Lawrence. Action track two, we have Gunhild Stordalen, physician, environmental activist, founder and president of EAT, of EAT Foundation, another one that doesn't need to be uh, for us to tell us who she is. Gunhild, nature positive production, what does that mean to your action track, action track two? Thank you so much, Christine and Joe, for bringing us all together. This is uh, super inspiring to, to listen to, and I'm grateful for being able to take part. Um, well, Action Track 2 is all about shifting to uh, sustainable consumption, but uh, also acknowledging that it has to be healthy. It has to deliver on Lawrence Action Track uh, on healthy, safe uh, nutrition for all. Uh, so uh, it's basically recognizing that food has a huge impact on the environment and that we are really running a deficits uh, on environmental or these uh, planetary boundaries. So uh, I think this is also a, a notion that sustainable uh, or do no harm agriculture is no longer good enough uh, because uh, if it's sustainable, it keeps us at zero, but it really fails to recognize that we are way beyond several of these planetary boundaries already. Uh, so what Action Track 3 is all about, uh, restoration and regeneration, obviously is also critical to bring us back within limits. Um, so I think also, um, on, on the link between shifting to sustainable food consumption uh, and nature positive production. I would say that we cannot achieve the one without the other. Uh, and we eat what we grow, uh, that's a, a fact. So unless we break the trend lines towards uh, increased consumption of just a very few crops, uh, I mean, wheat, rice, maize, uh, also combined with a few sources of cheap industrial meat, uh, then we, we really can't achieve sustainable consumption patterns. And this also goes obviously for ultra processed food. We know that 50% or 60% of our calories today come in the form of uh, junk food and uh, being able to shift to sustainable consumption patterns uh, within planetary boundaries won't be possible unless we uh, grow differently and a much more uh, diverse uh, set of plants and animals and do that in a way that works with nature, not against it. So thank you, over. Perfect, thanks Gunhild. Now for action track four, Joe and I agreed to switch it on each other's heads. He's going to tell me how he thinks, how he's heard me say it before, Action Track Fork knows nature positive production. Joe, were you listening? <laughs> yes, yes, I love this. Uh, thanks, Christine. Look, uh, we are all working across Action Tracks towards a sustainable, towards a, a sustainable present and food future. And I think that a sustainable future requires us all to halt and reverse biodiversity loss and limit climate change while improving livelihoods, creating resilience, and meeting the fundamental human right to healthy and nutritious food for all. This is how I see a sustainable food future. And this is what connects our action tracks, especially three and four, as you mentioned. And it's only possible to achieve this by transforming the food system and adopting nature positive production practices at scale within planetary boundaries. And when we talk about nature positive, like I mentioned before, we also mean people positive. Right, So one needs to equate the other. And we need to pursue solutions that deliver both. And as an example, although different solutions will be required in different contexts, the work of the action tracks uh, are doing, for example, on agroecology is a funda fundamental part of this, of this transformation, Christine. This is because agroecology delivers, uh, uh, what, what uh, agroecology delivers is a fundamental part of the transformation. Agroecology delivers uh, social and environmental outcomes. It improves both. It ensures dignified livelihoods as much as it ensures nature positive impacts. We have, uh, in my view, 
a unique opportunity to accelerate the adoption of agroecological approaches uh, within the Food System Summit and to ensure that its relevant principles can be transferred to all nature positive production practices, all of them. Um, and we need to align also agroecology more and more with the UNF Triple C agenda, with the CBD, with UN CCD, the Oceans Conference, why not? You know, uh, and accelerate the adoption of these approach, approaches to ensure its relevant principles can, can be transferred, as I mentioned. Um, one thing that we need to do, and we need to work hand in hand with uh, the CFS, the Committee on World Food Security, and leverage the great work and the great assets that they have, you know, such as the voluntary guidelines on food systems and nutrition, which was recently approved, and also the policy recommendations on agroecological and other innovative approaches for sustainable food systems. These are incredible yeah. assets that involved a lot of work from experts in this field. And we are committed to building upon it to evolve our uh, thinking in, in action track three, four, and all other action tracks. So um, yeah, that's a, a back over to you, Kristen. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks for that, Joe. And that gave me a chance to give a few minutes to look at the Q&A. Lots of questions about blue food, aquatic foods, seaweeds. And that's another way that action track three and four are working closely together because in Zhao's action track, on action track three, he can't be thinking of fish and flora without the fisher folks. So we're definitely working across the action tracks when we really think of these, these propositions that are being put forward. Sandrine, you're co-chairing uh, action track five with Salim Hook. You're also president of the Clo Clo sorry, Club of Rome. Um, what does nature positive production mean to your action track? Thank you so much, Christine. And I just want to compliment again, Joao, for this very important event. And um, as Lawrence said, and also Gunhild, I think that, um, first of all, let me start by saying that nature is the underbelly of resilience, and we are the resilience action track. So as people and nature move together, we need to make sure that that One Health approach is fully integrated across resilience. And, and I wanna say that one of the, the, the shifts that we've seen in the way in which we're collaborating together, all of us, is the fact that actually we've seen that we need to put in place a systems approach, that we need to tear down all the silos. So nature is not just action track three, but as we've already seen, crosses all the action tracks. Climate change hits us all. And we all know that people are on the front lines, which is most important to action track for. So the fact of the matter is that what we've tried to do through the resilience action track or action areas and the clusters is to first of all, look at the humanitarian development peace nexus and the way in which the nexus looks at also nature through the way in which water, energy and food is looked at through an integrated resilient food system. Then we also actually look at enhancing local production for local consumption, which again takes into consideration very local procurement processes and how much more agroecology or more natural processes are taken into consideration in the production of food. And that's under our universal food access to build resilience. And then most importantly, we are obviously, because we need to look at both the pandemic, but also at crises and risk management, we're very much looking at what are those resilient development pathways, in particular when we're looking at the climate risks and the way in which we look at adaptation, mitigation. We know how much biodiversity in nature plays an unbelievably important role, both in terms of afforestation, in terms of carbon stocks, soil management, et cetera. To get into some of the more specifics, and you mentioned blue food, clearly we need to look at fragile zones and nature and the protection of our most fragile island zones, those that actually are on the front line of prob probably losing their islands to oceans encroaching is very important. And therefore, how do we look at mangrove development? How do we look at also the way in which we obviously look at the seas in terms of the development of the seas, which is both climate and nature positive rather than negative. So mangrove reforestation, ocean reforestation and macroalgae. But then obviously we've all talked about agroecology. We also need to look at land use in general. So agroforestry in addition to agroecology and the biodiversity links within that. And then I would just add and finish 
with the way in which we really need to put in place these more integrated systems approaches. So as we've all said, as we move forward together and we look at the role that nature plays across all our action tracks and we look at the link with people, we have to realize that if we don't get it right on nature and when if we don't live within our planetary boundaries, then we won't actually be able to create those jobs and those livelihoods for the smallholders, for the farmers that we so want to protect. So I guess I'll leave it at that and just by finishing that for us in the resilience track, nature clearly is the underbelly of resilience and it is the underbelly of what we'll be able to do in order to have a holistic and productive food system that continues to serve us people, but also the planet. Well, I said 15. Incredibly, incredibly useful. And as you can see, the overlap between us. Um, I One of the questions that came in is how have members been, member states been engaging in defining and prioritizing the propositions put forward? How are we really getting this buy-in from the beginning, including with government agencies as well? I think, Gunhild, if it's okay, I'm going to come to that question to you first and then maybe over to Lawrence. Uh, perhaps you can start with Lawrence, uh, Christine. Sure, I wasn't sure. I was going to come to you first, Lawrence, but I saw you got interrupted there for a second. So I did, Christ <laughs> Christine, I, I did. Could you repeat the question? I'm very sure, sorry. Of course, no problem. Um, a question from the audience was, how are member states getting engaged in defining and shaping, building coalitions behind some of the propositions that are coming forward? But not only member states, a second question was about, what about intergovernmental agencies, UN agencies? How is everybody getting involved in our, in our proposition development? Uh, thanks, Christine, and thanks for the question. Um, I mean, everyone's piling in. It's an open door, and we're inviting everyone to come and join the fun. Um, so, uh, on the UN agencies, there, you know, anyone who wants to join is is welcome to join, and they're they're invited to join. And we we say, what are you interested in? And we link them up with the person that is developing the idea. On the member states, um, specifically, we're paying a lot of attention, all of us, to member states because. We know that if member states are not actively engaged, then we failed. This is a member state summit. It's a UN summit. So it's for the member states. So in each action track has about 20, 25, 30 member states who have signed up to active participation. And so we update them every week. They're in every leadership team meeting. Uh, we've Most of us have had one-to-one -one meetings with each of the member states. We're trying to find out what are your priorities? Uh, what would you like to share with the rest of the summit? Things that are, are successful from your country that you want to share and showcase. And then which of, the, which of these nascent emerging game changers would you like to co-construct with us? Um, so we're getting ideas from the member states. Uh, Chile just, just submitted a really interesting one to us on uh, nutritious food coupons. And we're getting them all the time. So we're getting we're getting priorities from the dialogues and from the member states. We're getting um, ideas from the member states. We're getting things they would like to share with the rest of the country, the rest of the countries and the stakeholders from the member states. And we're getting active engagement in co-construction of of game changers. Uh, and and that's what it's all about. If they're not excited by the game changers, then we will have failed. Back to you, Christine. Thanks. That was super comprehensive. Anything to add, Gunhild, or should I go straight to Sandrine? Yeah, no, I can I, I can add. And I always love uh, Laura to, to go first because then he basically sums it up so well. Uh, well, it, I, I, I think it's also worth mentioning that uh, now the action areas are wide open uh, and member states uh, are coming in and participating and contributing uh, where they would like to. Uh, we um, we are now likely to have some uh, member states co-leading on some of, some of these action areas. Uh, and Action Track 2 has also been holding uh, policy boot camps uh, with member states to um, help them uh, co-create solutions to specific uh, food systems challenges they are facing. Uh, and as Lauren said, without member states, we are not getting anywhere. Uh, and, and on the solution uh, prioritization and ranking, 
that was defined um, ag against criteria for all the action tracks and also with uh, support from the science group. Uh, but then obviously the solutions must be further developed and co-created with member states and other uh, stakeholders. Over. Excellent. Sandrine, I see you have your hand up before we come over to Rattan. Sandrine, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Christine. I just wanted to build on what Gunhild and Lawrence just indicated around member state participation, because I think we need to realize that we've all received probably half, if not more, of our solutions are coming from member states. And therefore, a lot of the thinking is, is due to their thinking and concrete examples. Um, we just received in this second wave almost 40 more solutions from member states. So we're still unpacking all of that. But I just wanted to add that also what the action tracks are doing, and I think this is very important as we continue to try to be as transparent and as Lauren said, as open to agencies, to experts, to scientists to join our work, is to also work with the member states in breaking down their silos. Because we all know that negotiations are often when we talk about food undertaken by ministries of agriculture. And I think the beauty again of the collaborative work that we're doing and the work that we're all doing with member states is to break down the silos within their own countries and bring forward some of the key ideas that need to be systemic in approach and bring in again, nature, biodiversity, climate, and the links in terms of full resilience and access to food for people. Brilliant. Ritan, you've had your hand up for a while. Oh, yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Kristen, my concern is I hear conservation agriculture, agroforestry, integrated soil fertility management, uh, complex cropping system. These are practices, examples. Agroecology is a scientific concept under which these practices and others fit. There's a big confusion. So agroecology can be a hub, like soil can be a hub under which different practices fit. If somebody else has a different opinion about agroecology, it's a science. Let me hear it. Great, thanks for that, Ratan. Zhao, we're meeting today for Action Track 3. So we've heard how member states have been involved, <laughs> have been involved, but it, it feels a bit nebulous to those who are on the call. How do the people in today's meeting get involved in what's being presented today? What are our entry points for Action Track 3? All right, so the entry points for everyone are the action areas. Now that we have them defined, there are 15 action areas across Action Tracks. So we have leads and co-leads for each one of them. So that's the best way to enter. About the member states, uh, Christine, in Action Track 3, uh, we have received in the first wave 16% uh, of the solutions came from, from member states uh, compared to 22% of civil society and the same number, 22% from, from the private sector. So uh, in the second wave, we are pro processing many more. The way that we are working with member states in Action Track 3, we're having bilateral conversations with them. Uh, we are having uh, dedicated conversations to the group of the 24 member states that signed up to help uh, Action Track 3 get off the ground. Uh, now with the action areas, we're going to open and create these coalitions in which we hope that member states will, will join in larger numbers. Now, of the 24 member states that are part of Action Track 3, I don't know how it is with the other action tracks, but there are lots of member states from the North. Uh, and we do need to uh, increase the participation of the global South, if I may. You know, especially from low and middle income countries, we need to bring in their voices. We need to stimulate their participation. Sometimes they don't participate, I, I, I suspect, because of lack of capacity. So we need the help of the 24 member states that are participating to reach out to a larger number of member states so that we can have an equal balance and equal participation in them. So, um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that, Joe, and thanks fellow, fellow Action Track leads and chairs. This next session fits perfectly because not only are we looking in the UN Food System Summit, but how is all this work integrating with other global agendas going on? How do we make sure all the commitments made, all the thoughts that are happening in the 
um, COP20, CBD COP, the UNCCD, the Ocean Summit are being combined and being pulled into the, to the Food System Summit, but also that the Food System Summit outcomes are feeding those processes as well. So we have three minute presentations today. Uh, first on COP20 from Chris Booth, who is Marrakesh, the Marrakesh Partnership, before moving to CBD COP with David Cooper, Deputy Executive Secretary of CBD. And third in line, we have UNCCD with Sasha Alexander from UNCCD, and then the Ocean Summit from Tom Grasso of EDF. So starting off with Chris, the floor is yours. I see your lips moving, Chris, but I don't. Can you hear see you. my lips? I have perfect. I have double double mute. Can you hear me now? You're on now. Yes, perfect. Okay, great. I just always always best to be best prepared, but uh, double mute sometimes overdoes it. So um, great, thank you, Christine. Um, yeah. So my name's Chris Bus. Um, I'm I'm actually it's sort of in the in the title says representing the Marrakesh Partnership and and the high level champions, but my my role is. Um, I'm supporting the nature-based solutions and land use track of the of the high-level champions work. Um, the high-level champions in support of the Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action, which is the body to mandated to drive the outcomes of the the Paris Agreement um, from a non-state actor's perspective. Um, so, as the high-level champions team, which has a, a large remit to 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 drive to, to work with the Marrakesh partnership, we work in, in we work we're we working in support of that, and and we we there's, there's two th two threads of work around that. So that for the, the the high level champions, the key campaigns that we have are the race to zero, the race to resilience, um, plus key sectoral sectoral breakthroughs. Um, the first two race to zero race to resilience is the, the mitigation adaptation of the two main pillars for, for climate change action um, as per the, the, the Paris Agreement. So um, I think just to, to sort of line of, of where we're going with COP26, and I think it was really interesting hearing that I jumped in and heard the last 20 minutes of the last session and, and much was made of the links with nature, biodiversity and climate. And, and to a certain extent, my, that was actually saying exactly how we're, we're, you know, we're positioned in this and how we see the links with our work for COP26 relating to the Food System Summit. Um, the work framed by the high level champions and within the Marrakesh partnership is framed around protect, restore and produce. There's also in the Marrakesh partnership, there's also a, a component on supply chains, consumptions, diets and waste. But as, a, as the high level champions, we're focused much more on the protect, restore and produce um, and how those uh, <clears throat> how, how we can accelerate action under those three implementation pillars for for climate change action. But in fact, the, the, the elements of work that, that, that we're focusing on and supporting and driving is, 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 is intensively related to some of the discussions that are that are happening around on this track in relation to in relation to the nature positive production systems. In fact, all our, you know, all the work that we have is framed around the narrative of na nature positive. So protect. We're engaged in processes like the fat dialogue, the fact dialogue, which is working on the forest and commodity supply chains, um, reducing deforestation, and we're working to sign up um, uh, actors to, to to accelerate their drive to net zero. Um, also working on um, working with 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 financial alliances on deforestation free investments. Um, so the ultimate aim under the UNFCCC is reducing deforestation, reduced emissions increased capture of, of, of carbon stocks but you can see just in relation to that of how we're involved in the, you know, the, the commodity supply chains um, and the food production systems as a critical component of that. Under Restore um, we're obviously working towards the, the New York Declaration of Forest a target of 350 million hectares but also bringing in a, a component of regenerative agriculture linked to that um, and so within that, that target of 350 million, million hectares, driving non-state actor engagement in delivering that, we actually have a strong focus on Africa um, <clears throat> as a, as a sub-campaign due to COP27, 
um, being in Africa, proposed to be in Africa. So we're driving land restoration, working very strongly with, with agribusinesses, um, really focusing on that forest and farm interface. So whilst we're looking at the, the carbon capture benefits of improved agricultural systems, of agroforestry systems, in fact, there's, you know, this is, a, this is a also, you know, the key driver as, as we're seeing in, in some aspects is working with the agribusinesses to secure yield, to sequester carbon, to make sure it's socially just. So working on, on those, 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 th those three S's to, to drive that. And then we're also looking at the, the third component of protect, restore is produce. That's where we have a large program around regenerative agriculture, obviously linked to restore, but this is driving specific driving ambition with agribusinesses to net zero, the role of farming systems to help to achieve that, but also making sure that's linked to agricultural yields and exploring processes like the voluntary carbon markets and, and carbon sinks and, and potential links around that, the, the work that's being done there, um, all underpinned by the nature positive agenda um, and strong farmer engagement. So really seeing the, the role that um, <clears throat> the land use systems are playing, not just only in climate change solutions, but also in longer term, sustainable agricultural system, production systems, et cetera. And, and underpinning all of that is, is making sure we have a, a set of credible, robust metrics on the race to zero, um, the race to resilience, working with, with, with initiatives such as SP, SBTI to, to drive that. And, and, and in, in moving towards COP26, I think the synergies with the Food Systems Summit and particularly this track, the IUCN Conservation Congress, these are all great opportunities to, to enhance and strengthen our message to COP26. That's excellent, Chris. Thank you so much for making those linkages to FCCC. Now we have David Cooper, as I said, from CBD COP. David, your three minutes starts now. Thanks very much, Christine, and thanks for the opportunity to, to join this important uh, conversation. Um, really, when we look at the future of biodiversity and the changes that are needed to, to, to move towards our 2050 vision, um, nothing is more important than the, the way we manage food uh, and agriculture. Uh, and I think this is, largely important, largely the same for when we, you know, we're looking at health and human well-being, the sustainable development goals. Uh, and so we're certainly very keen uh, uh, to be linking with the UN um, Food System Summit. Uh, we're participating in Action Track 3, but the other action tracks are also relevant. It's important because the biggest drivers of biodiversity loss are largely related to the food and agricultural sectors. Land use change <clears throat> on land, over-exploitation in the oceans, but also uh, overuse of fertilizers and pesticides. And of course, also the effects that are mediated through climate change. So we need to reduce these drivers if we're going to protect um, biodiversity. And to do that, we also look have to look further in the food system in terms of reducing overconsumption, particularly of, of, of meat products and reducing waste. But we're interested in this also because it's not just about looking at biodiversity as a, as a victim of these, these problems. Biodiversity can be part of the solution. And in fact, we think by making better use of biodiversity in agricultural systems, in food systems, we can actually contribute to the sustainable intensification of agriculture through ecological uh, intensification, agroecological approaches, uh, and actually contribute to reducing the, the need for expanding the, um, the land footprint of, of agriculture. So investing in soil biodiversity, in soil health. And in fact, um, our subsidiary bodies will be discussing a plan of action on uh, soil biodiversity uh, next week on um, restoring pollinators, in really important for those crops that are most nutritious. We produce plenty of calories, but not usually enough nutrients. 
uh, pollinators are essential for that, using natural pest control uh, and so on and so on. So, you know, we think if by investing in, in, in the biodiversity behind agriculture, we can actually move to a win-win solution. So these issues uh, were highlighted in our fifth Global Biodiversity Outlook, um, sets out a number of uh, uh, transitions there. And now they're being discussed as parties of the convention negotiate the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, which is then due to be considered in Kunming, China, uh, scheduled for later this year. So really important linkages, thanks. Thanks so much for that, David, and for highlighting the pollinators and nutrition. I know Lawrence Haddad, well, who's still on the line, will be happy to hear that from Action Track One. Sasha Alexander, I know you have a presentation on the UNCCD. Would you like to pull that up for yeah. us now? Excellent. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. I will be very brief. I know that we're running out of time, and um, you've heard a lot about UNCCD and land degradation neutrality throughout this um, Forum, uh, we are, our mandate is to assist countries uh, to combat desertification, land degradation, and drought. Um, there, uh, many of the UN uh, entities have uh, unique entry points uh, to the Food System Summit, and will have unique uh, roles in implementing the outcomes of the summit. Uh, so I think it's an important thing for this session to, to look at the, uh, the existing uh, linkages uh, between the, uh, the UN system as a whole, uh, and then in particular, the, the multilateral environmental agreements, uh, because many of those, uh, like the Rio conventions, uh, come with uh, 195 member states, and we often um, have different um, focal points from different ministries. Uh, so this is a, a really a, a communications um, product where we need to um, bring a whole of government approach uh, to the Food System Summit, not just the agricultural ministry, but the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Land Use Planning, uh, and so forth. Uh, and so what we've done here, and you can uh, go to the beginning of the chat if you want to download this uh, PDF. Um, this brochure uh, is really just a, a brief overview of, a, of an analysis we did. Uh, and um, the linkage here is, is basically looking at um, uh, accelerating progress uh, for the other SDGs um, through land restoration, uh, through conservation and sustainable management. And uh, we, have the, we have the anchor point in SDG uh, target 15.3, which explicitly calls for restoring degraded land and soil. Um, the UNCCD and its partners have set up uh, various mechanisms uh, to build capacity and mobilize resources in our member states uh, to, uh, to implement this LDN target. Uh, and to date, we have about 125 countries that are participating uh, in, this, in these programs. Uh, which center around the three pillars um, of, of land degradation neutrality, avoid, reduce, and reverse, uh, which are very similar to protect, manage, and restore. Um, so just a couple of data points here that, that we are um, using in terms of our scenarios for the future and how we respond to, to those scenarios. Um, the summit is uh, what we think, what we're trying to do with this brochure is really raise awareness of the opportunity that the summit brings to existing institutions, UN uh, processes uh, that could be leveraged uh, with, the, uh, with the goals and the um, outcomes of the summit. Uh, in particular, the, the uh, resource mobilization and the partnerships, the innovative business models uh, that we think will come out of the summit. Uh, so this brochure goes into detail about um, 80, 86 countries that are participating in our program and, and sees the, um, the actionable um, uh, response actions, actually. So a lot of these revolve around governance, agroecosystems, risk management, uh, and it, um, the, a lot of them are focused on action track three, 
the majority of our countries that have submitted their um, reports on, on land degradation and neutrality, their initial reports, have identified croplands, rangelands, grasslands, uh, soils, uh, livestock management as their highest priorities. And they've set targets, they've identified priority areas, and they're looking now to, to, um, to implement transformative projects and programs in those areas. So these are all things that contribute to uh, all of the action tracks uh, and that could be um, used, um, uh, uh, I think, effectively uh, to leverage uh, the work that's being done in the summit. Um, so with that, we, we, we end in the brochure with the call to action um, to, to really um, uh, invigorate our, um, our focal points from different ministries uh, to come together uh, through the different uh, mechanisms that the, the summit offers us. So, so with that, I, I appreciate your attention. Thank you so much. Sasha, that was brilliant. I know we've met before this meeting, but I definitely, like everybody, want that presentation. <laughs> these are so great to see how all the work of all the action tracks are being integrated in all these intergovernmental processes. So thank you for the work that you do. I know that's been a question in the Q&A, and yes, the recording and presentations will become available in the next newsletter that will go to absolutely everybody on this call. Um, Tom, Ocean Summit, what are the linkages? Oh, either your volume, either my volume's not low enough or you're on mute. No, still can't hear you. I can see you unmuting and muting yourself, so it should be working. <laughs> Our computers are taking over. They're like, they finally figured out it after one year. Uh, I'll give you a minute to keep practicing um, and maybe Peter on our end from WWF. You want to try again? Go ahead, Tom. No, no. <laughs> uh, maybe um, uh, disconnect and reconnect and we'll try again. In the meantime, I was just going to add how some other inter interlinkages, interlinkages with other intergovernmental processes. Ooh, what a tongue twister. So you would have heard Zhao today talk about the Committee on World Food Security. I know in other action tracks, we're, we're very involved with following the WTO process, the World Trade Organization is leading, or the World, the World Health Assembly, the WHO. And part of that work that we're doing as action track leads and teams, because it's definitely not just us, it's teams of hundreds of thousands of people behind us, um, is we're definitely meeting with the missions in Geneva, in Bonn, in Rome, in New York, to make sure that everybody's talking across um, ministries and across work silos, because it's so important when we think of systems to really interconnect across all these processes that we're all involved in. Um, it isn't easy. It's a huge challenge for all of us to stretch our brains on this level, but it, it's essential if we're really talking about systems. So Tom- Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect, perfect, perfect. segue. Back to you, Tom. I think, I think my Zoom uh, connection isn't used to me being muted all the time because I seem to talk too much. So, you know, that's what happens. Um, so anyway, thanks again, Christine, and thanks, Joe, for the opportunity. Um, I wanted to say that EDF, the Environmental Defense Fund, has been involved in the development of some of the uh, provisions in Action Track 3. Uh, related to blue and aquatic foods, but I also wanted to offer a challenge and uh, both an offer and a challenge today to the other action tracks that the Environmental Defense Fund and the Blue Food Assessment Group that we're partnering with and the Friends of Ocean Action are happy to help identify ways that we can incorporate blue and aquatic foods into your action tracks as well. Uh, and in order to do that, I thought I'd whet your appetite uh, today with some examples of how blue and aquatic foods can meet not only the SDG 14, but a number of other SDGs. So I'm gonna kind of do a quick run through the SDGs that we think are most uh, related to blue foods and then happy to answer any questions. So, so first of all, uh, SDG number one, no poverty. Blue foods feed some of the poorest and most vulnerable communities in the world, communities that are both micronutrient deficient as well as climate, uh, climate threatened. SDG number two, zero hunger. Blue foods provide affordable and, and accessible essential nutrients with less environmental impact than other animal proteins, particularly for many poor and vulnerable communities and coastlines across the world. SDG number three, good health and well-being. 
Blue foods are one of, the, of nature's most plentiful superfoods, providing micronutrients like zinc, vitamin A, and omega-3 fatty acids, reducing risks of prenatal and maternal, maternal mortality, growth retardation, child mortality, cognitive deficiencies, and reduced immune function. Gender equality, number five. Roughly 11% of all fish workers around the world are women, but in many countries in, in uh, low income and me medium income uh, countries, some, in some cases, 45% of those fish workers are women. So SDG five is an important, uh, an important milestone for Blue Foods as well. SDG eight, decent work and ec economic growth. 90% of all fisheries are small scale fisheries that em employ Many millions of, of, um, of men and women are an important part of local livelihoods as well as global food security. SDG number 12, responsible consumption of the, responsible consumption. 10% of the world's population is at risk of malnutrition related to overfishing. Proper management of fisheries can contribute significantly to sustain, sustainable provisioning of food, thereby lowering environmental and social impacts from other sources. And then SDG 13, I think this won't come as any surprise on climate change, reforming wild fisheries under climate resilient fisheries management with sustainable mariculture and aquaculture can help feed the world while reducing the impacts of climate change from blue carbon. So those are some of the other SDGs beyond SDG 14 that can be met, can help be met by blue foods and aquatic foods. And we, uh, as the group I mentioned before, the Blue Food Assessment folks, Environmental Defense Fund, and the Friends of Ocean Action are ready to help um, address those issues and the other action tracks as well. Thank you. Tom, before you get off mute, uh, get yourself back on mute. There's a question. <laughs> yeah. What is meant by indivisible underwater issues for blue foods and whether people are seeing attention by member states on integrating fisheries and aquatic culture into their food system policies? Uh, I think I think what the, what's meant is that you know if we think about uh, the oceans uh, and and you know the, the Earth is known as the blue planet because over seventy percent of the Earth's surface is water and and the vast majority of that is oceans but we don't want to forget our freshwater uh, ecosystem colleagues as well um, but it's not something we notice every day we don't look at our window um, necessarily and see what is beneath the value the biodiversity value the climate change the climate um, balancing that the oceans provide for our planet, the, the food that it provides, the jobs that it provides. Um, but, it, but it's an important part of what makes uh, Earth function for humans. And so I think the idea that it's, it's invisible is something um, that we need to, to make uh, more visible to people. And I think the UN Food System Summit would be a perfect place. Uh, and I think one of the biggest game changes that could come out of the UN Food System Summit would be to recognize blue foods as a fundamental part of solving uh, global food security across across um, across all action tracks and and have it be first and foremost identified as a priority. So let's make it uh, visible or uninvisible. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thanks, Tom. Centurion, yeah. I know in action track five, you're actively involved in all of these intergovernmental processes that we've just uh, showcased. Would you like to add a few words to that, to the work that you're doing, please? Yeah, absolutely, Christine. And I'll build a little bit on what Tom said as well. Um, the first point is that not only do we need to ensure that there's cross-fertilization in terms of the way in which we interact with the governments, because they're all going to be saying sometimes slightly different things at these different conferences. So we need to hold governments accountable to the narratives and to the key points and pledges that we want to make through the UN Food System Summit action track work. But in addition to that, I think what's really important is to also bring in this cross fertilization, which you mentioned so nicely of bringing down, bringing down the, the silos and, and creating cross fertilized narratives. So we know that we will be speaking about net zero impacts, whether it be net zero waste, food waste, which will have an impact on climate. We will have some other net zero declarations, which can be linked also to both 
the champions work in COP26, but also the resilience work, not only in terms of just net zero shifts for industry. So I think that, again, that cross fertilization is really important. So the more that we can all come together with very similar calls to action, the better it will be if we really want to meet all of our joint ambitious goals. And I think the one other point I wanted to just make on blue food is that it's not only blue food, but it's the interaction between the oceans and the land. As I was indicating, some of those more fragile zones, the, the impact that we know climate change is having on island states and also the loss of some of their uh, blue food. So I think, again, that interrelationship and understanding the need to bring in all the different parts of the food system and to think through it also in terms of different geographies and how they're impacted differently. Great, thanks so much for that, Sundering. One question that I'm gonna throw back to the panelists is, how are we engaging farmers in each of these agendas, intergovernmental processes that we've heard today? And I think that's super important to touch on. Sandri just mentioned accountability and we all, all stakeholders that are involved in these processes have a different role to play and an equally important role to play. And we appreciate that even consultations such as the one that we're involved in today, people have connectivity issues access to the internet. Some of our presenters today that knew that they were presenting are also struggling. We also know that they're time consuming. They take time away from our loved ones, our jobs. So how do we really make sure that the voices of the most underrepresented are put forward? Um, we also know the inherent biases. Who owns the cell phone in the household? Um, is it the mom? Is it the dad? And all that weighs into the, the view, the, the lens upon which um, we're getting this information. So I'm opening the floor to the presenters that we just had on how, how is it possible to engage more farmers and small scale producers and fisher folk and everybody inv across the, involved across the um, food system into these discussions. The floor is open or I will start calling on you. <laughs> Christine, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in since my mute is still off. Um, so we, the Environmental Defense Fund and a number of other colleagues launched uh, earlier this year a um, interactive website called Small Scale Fisheries Hub. And I'll put a link to it in the chat, but it's an opportunity for fish, fishers and fish workers around the world to learn about solutions for their livelihoods as well as for the oceans that they rely on. They're an essential part of the solution. And I would also note that the the summit could itself ensure incorporating the, the views of fishers by adopting uh, the language uh, that the UN Food and Agriculture Committee's Committee on Fisheries adopted several years ago called the Small Scale Fisheries Guidelines, which was uh, very, very much uh, developed um, with the support and advice and insights of small scale fisher organizations around the world. So we'd highly recommend the summit to acknowledge uh, the role that that Kofi and small scale fishers did in that. So I think those are a couple ways, and I'll put the link to our hub where people can access and find out more about uh, how to how to include small fish worker fish uh, fish producers in their in the work that they do. Thank you. Thanks for that, Tom. I'm going to beat you by sticking a, a few links in the chat before yours. Um, yeah. Another way to engage. Can I just jump in, Christine? Definitely. Just, yeah, go for it. it. I, go for it. I mean, I, actually, the, I would be intrigued to hear the answer to the question because the question was actually to related to how the food system summit is engaging farmers um and i think you know we as but i think the, but the complementarity between the, the processes is is critical that we've all just talked about um and uh that obviously with the role of the high level champions in the marrakesh partnership that's engagement of non-state actors and you know, the farm farmers are critical part of the engagement strategy for 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 us and engaging with farmers as i say we mentioned we we have the, the specific campaign around around africa but that's also there's the global component of engaging with with engaging with farmers and farmer organizations from the global north and south um will be will be critical in these in these processes and and probably can't you know can't do enough to to get them engaged i sort of <clears throat> probably didn't you, you mentioned the word accountability um, sometimes the account, the word accountability also comes with, with you know, particularly to, to smallholders and, and community farming organisations, comes with a 
sort of threat if you don't if you don't do what we want you to do it's but actually should you know there's also the word opportunity and they are the la largest la land managers that we have and need to be engaged in all these discussions as we drive towards a nature positive well na you know there's nature positive farming nature positive action um i think that they are the critical delivery mechanism that we must engage with Thanks for that, Chris, and for clarifying the question. I, I read it quickly, so I must not have misunderstood. Uh, must have misunderstood it. As far as in the summit, so there, there's also there's, there's this global dialogue that we're having, such as the one we're having today, but there's also regional, national, and subnational dialogues that governments are nominating conveners. You should get involved. That's the links that are in the chat that I put um, a, a word or two ago. I have Ratan and then Joe, I'm actually going to give you the full hand to close this session. So maybe Ratan, you first. Thank you so much. I'm glad you brought about uh, how to engage farmers. I hope, and I really uh, recommend very strongly, UN Food Summit must come up with some uh, statement toward how to enhance respect and dignity of the farming profession. This is very critical. You look at all professions and farming, which produces food and look after the environment, have the least respect and dignity amongst all. UN Food Summit must come up with a statement how to improve that. Thanks for that, Ratan. As I mentioned, when we first started this event, I used to be a small scale farmer in Canada and I'm no longer. It's it's really, really tough. So how do me and Action Track 4, how do I make sure um, with the people that I'm working with that livelihoods are made better so that people will have dignified yeah. livelihoods? Exactly. Awesome. Thank you for mentioning that, Ratan. Jao, this is your action track. You're leading us. So I'm going to pass over the floor to you to wrap us up um, and hopefully let us know a bit about these surveys that we've been running because I haven't been able to track that while, while moderated in parallel. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Joe, over to you. Thanks so much, Christine. Wonderful facilitation. Thanks for being with us. Uh, before we move on into the closing and showing the results survey, I'd like to just remind at, uh, something that Tom said, blue food cuts across action tracks because it's only being managed. See, this, in these action areas, we have clusters of solutions that are managed, managed by different action tracks on behalf of all other action tracks. So, you know, Blue Food is one of these um, examples as we've been speaking, Tom, that cuts across from action track one to five. So, you know, rest assured that we will have members of each action track engage with you to, to move this forward. And uh, a word about farmers and fishers. You know, we have in the last public forum, uh, we came up with the idea of having a farmer and fisher specific event, a public forum for them. This is in the works. It's being led by AJ, who is the co-chair of Action Track 2 on behalf again of all other Action Tracks. So we are hoping to have this uh, farmers and fishers public forum uh, coming soon. So you now, know, can this I? Is, this is, yeah, please. Sorry, can please I go. jump in there real quick? Because mm -hmm. I wanted to mention we're uh, EDF and others are also going to host a dialogue uh, with fishers and farmers, and wanted uh, specifically to mention it to Rattan and others who who want to see the sort of respect for that part of our food production system uh, recognized more. And my colleague was will put the link to it in the chat. So I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, wonderful. Let's let's have you uh, connected with AJ, who's leading that. Maybe we can have a, a one event. I'm not sure how to go about it, but yes. So it's uh, this 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 is being uh, heard loud and, and clear. And you know, and I I always like to remind us that farmers and fishers are the first and ultimate stewards of uh, the natural world, right? So, and we need to create uh, policies and incentives to enable them. Uh, towards this this transition that we are we are um, uh, driving towards, you know there are um, nine harvests for us to make the change and and deliver the 2030 sustainable development goals. This is not much time, and we need to work with farmers and fishers from every size, from every country, to help make this transition. Without them on board, uh, the transformation of the food system won't happen. So, you know, we need to create the enabling conditions and policies to support them. Um, 
Well, I owed you a, uh, the results of the survey, first of all. Uh, the problem is that I have my mobile phone divided in four screens and I cannot read what's in there. So, uh, Peter, can you maybe take this over just to, to, to report back on the survey, if I may put you on the spot, I'm sorry. Yes, no problem, Joao. Um, sorry, everybody, I uh, work with Joao at WWF um, Communications. Uh, so we ran the poll to start, and I think you should all be able to see the results are on screen now um, for those that you voted. So uh, it's just interesting, little interesting things to see that a lot of people actually do have some experience with growing food. While we don't necessarily have a lot of full-time farmers on the call today, a lot of people have got some experience in growing food. Um, seeing where people are calling in from, probably unsurprisingly given the time zones, um, a lot of people in Europe and the Americas, um, and then looking probably at the biggest one to look at, the, an outcome that people are hoping the summit drives towards. The two things that came out of this were around um, a pathway towards a binding agreement. So, so something potentially like the Paris Agreement for Climate, in which member states are actually um, making binding obligations towards transformation. But also on the other side of things, a lot of people hoping to see raised awareness within the public that actually drives mobilization and behavior change. Um, so those were the three questions we asked of the group. And just very quickly as well, um, I will share the uh, pigeonhole that we were looking at and the things that were coming to the top of this in terms of the solutions that have the most potential to help drive those outcomes that we've just mentioned. Uh, regenerative agriculture, soils hub, agroecology, agrobiodiversity, which is something that we've already talked about a little bit less, and innovation. So uh, those are the ones coming to the top. There are votes for everything, um, and definitely some additional uh, thoughts that have come in that uh, Joao and the rest of the Action Track leadership will take and begin to integrate again into the game changing solutions. Um, the surveys are still open. We'll put the links in the chat box. So if you've added a comment into the pigeonhole um, and you want to submit more detail, please do uh, submit that through the public survey and we can make sure that content's captured and brought into the, the development of the solutions and the areas of collective action. Next one. Yes, thank, uh, thanks, Peter. Um, yes, so uh, there is one more clarification that I should make before we, we wrap up and we close. And I say thank you to everybody. It's about the 15 action areas. Uh, these 15 action areas, we finalized the consultation uh, with member states last week it was last friday so what you see here um in one of the slides that i showed the 15 action areas is brand new uh we are now working on assigning the co-leads for them and then create the working groups uh that will be part of these coalitions and this should be published uh you know hopefully in the summit website soon if not this week uh but you know so the consultation process just ended so i just thought about giving you a first um, overview of these 15 action areas. So it's it's coming up on, on our website soon. Um, well, look, I now it's the moment for me to, to, to be grateful to you. I would like to start by thanking um, UNCCD, who are co-conveners of Action Track 3 alongside WWF, and who is engaging all the UN agencies. Uh, so uh, Miriam and Sasha, you're doing a fabulous job. And thank you for your for your support in this. I'd also like to thank all of our action area leads of Action Track Three. Uh, you are an A team, and we would not be able to deliver what we are delivering uh, without you on board. So thank you for for your generous uh, time and effort to guide us, um, you know, in a in a in a stable and and concrete pathway towards um, the summit. I'd also like to thank my uh, colleagues from other action tracks, the action track chairs. It's a joy to work with you uh, almost on an everyday basis. And uh, so thank you for connecting with action track three, for uh, looking for synergies. And, uh, you know, we have uh, ahead of us a, a really uh, inspiring road to transform the food system. So thank you for joining our public forum. Also, I would like to thank the participation of our uh, external guests that took their time uh, you know, to talk to us about how to better integrate the work of our Action Track 
three uh, with the climate, biodiversity, land and oceans agenda. So thanks, Chris, David, Tom and Sasha. And uh, thanks to Christine, uh, our uh, great colleague from Action Track 4, who did a, a wonderful job at facilitating the event. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all my WWF team who put this, this session together and organized. There's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes for this to happen. So thank you very much. And finally, thanks to all of you, you know, who have been pushing us and who have been advising us to do better as we move along. Uh, the food, the transformation of the food system is not easy. There is not a single angle to it. And uh, we need to be pushed and we need to push each other. So let's do it. Let's push each other. We have nine harvests ahead of us to deliver the change that we need to, to, to attain to deliver the SDGs. And I am most grateful to all of you, member states and member states and everyone who joined us today. So Thank you very much. Have a great day and I will see you next time. Goodbye.